Greetings and welcome back to Junior English and our study in the My Perspectives volume. I'm with you on page 30, 31 and following. We are now going to look at the preamble to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Now, as we have been saying for a number of times in our time together as Junior studying American thought, American literature, American events and history, that there is an argument to be made, and it's often made by people like, uh, within my age demographic, that you guys are not patriotic. Now, I'm not completely certain that argument holds any water, but I've often said, and I've said it here with you guys a number of times, and I'll say it again for our conversation here, if you guys are not patriots, or you don't consider yourselves patriots of your country, it is not your fault, in my estimation, but rather it is people in my generation's fault for not giving you a reason to be a patriot. You're not born a patriot. You have to choose to be a patriot. And I believe the primary reason that you choose to be a patriot is somebody gives you a legitimate reason to think about honoring, respecting, um, celebrating your country. While obviously at the same time, we're, go we're going to do it in this conversation, we can point out the fundamental flaws of much of the early American thought. No question about it. However, I think that when you finish this study, just like when you finish your study of the Declaration of Independence and any number of other precious documents in American thought, you can't help but sit up and go, oh, it took a lot of courage and a lot of foresight to put the words together that would in fact create the story that is America. Remember, our essential question is, what is the meaning of freedom? Underline again that word meaning. So as we go to work here, let's remind ourselves one more time. We are fundamentally the stories that we tell and retell. We're also fundamentally the stories that we decide to accept or reject. And every generation, and I think this is back to the earlier point I was making, every generation has to engage these texts, these ideas, and decide, do we accept these ideas? Do we reject these ideas? The other thing I will say is that this study will set us up really well for the study that will come later when finally the states begin to decide to fight and go to war over the fundamental argument regarding slavery. And of course, standing behind so much of the conversation of that debate with Abraham Lincoln will fundamentally be our reading of this document. There are this, these are radical documents, as we said in our study of the Declaration of Independence. These are radical documents. They remain radical documents for today. Now, I want to jump over to page 30 real quickly and point out that Governor Morris, notice your date, 1752 to 1816, was a distinguished scholar, represented Pennsylvania in the Constitutional Convention. He made some 173 speeches during the proceedings of the convention, many of them in opposition to slavery. His work on the preamble to the Constitution earned him the title Penman of the Constitution. Now, of course, we know that we'll be studying the Constitution as well as uh, in this class, in our, in our history class, but it is this preamble, pre, that which comes before, amble, which is interesting because to ambulate means to walk. So it's almost as if it's before the real walk, we have to have this. Notice we're going to have two preambles here, actually, one for the Constitution and one for the Bill of Rights. We'll get to it in a moment. James Madison will be our, of course, author of the Bill of Rights, and you're with us again on page 30. 1751 to 1836, grew up in Virginia, later served in the state's legislature, the youngest member of the Continental Congress. I would underline that, the youngest member in the Continental Congress. He was skilled in working with delegates who held opposing views. I think also this is quite remarkable. He is often called the father of the Constitution for his role in drafting that, that document and the Bill of Rights, which followed it. Madison later served as the United States' as fourth president. Remarkable, remarkable thinker. Now, some background information is provided on page 31. Let's read it together. After the framers approved the Constitution, several of them called for an addition of more protections for individual liberties. I would underline that. Of course, right out to the side, this is the American tension. Fundamentally, what does it mean to be an American? Well, we're a paradox. We're a paradox. On the one hand, we will celebrate the group, the people, as it will be referred to. On the other hand, we think of each one of those, the people, as an individual person, and there's always going to be tension. Add into that that you have subsets of the people that will be called the states. So you really have an interesting kind of trinity at play here in terms of how all of this is going to triangulate. Can I use that phrase? More protections for the individual liberties. James Madison wrote up a list of amendments. Congress passed them and the states ratified ten of them. These ten amendments are now known as the Bill of Rights. Now as we go to the work with the preamble to the Constitution, I want to point out that this is a we 
do construction. I also want to note all of the verbs, although obviously your, your uh, book here on page 31 is going to suggest that you take a look at the nouns, but I'm fascinated by the verbs. Let's just take a look at it. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Notice this we, beginning with we, will take us obviously back to our study of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. In other words, speaking for all. The people again, as a collective, but you could circle it and put a question mark there. What people? Obviously at this moment in time in American history, we're not speaking about all the people that live here, obviously, right? I mean, people own slaves, for example, who will not be considered, according to this document, underneath this Constitution. Well, how is that even possible? Wait, wait, wait. That's why we study American thought. It is going to be important that the framers of this set of, uh, of lines, and of course the Bill of Rights, they themselves understood intuitively that the interpretation of these words would change over time. They wrote these words knowing that they would be studied by people like yourselves, students. We the people of the United States, notice it's in order, there's an intentionality here, to form, that is to say to build, a more perfect union. Now much has been made of this phrase, obviously to argue more perfect means always trying to improve. This is fundamental to what it means to be an American. Write it down. We're always looking to improve. Always looking to improve. And so reformers of all types have come back to this set of lines to say, look, we got to be better at. Well, what are we going to establish? Notice here all of your verbs. Notice your nouns. We're going to establish justice. We're going to ensure domestic tranquility. That is to say that we can all somehow live together. We're going to provide for common defense. That's huge. We're going to promote the general welfare, as defined by who is obviously going to be the question and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, that's you. All of that, we the people, do ordain, that is to say, this is interesting language, ordain. To ordain means to what? Well, to bless, to compliment, to decide. It's again about intentionality. And establish the Constitution of the United States of America. Now, Obviously, that will lead us to the study of the Constitution. But let's jump now to the Bill of Rights. First of all, to the preamble. Congress of the United States began and held at the city of New York on Wednesday, the 4th of March, 1789. So think about your date and your timing from 1776 to 1789. The conventions of a, no of a number of the states having at the time of their adopting the Constitution expressed a desire in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its powers. I would, I would circle that. That further declaratory and restrictive clauses, I would circle the word restrictive, should be added. Notice the colon. And as extending the ground of public confidence in the government, public confidence is always going to be the key that stands behind all of this documentation, will best ensure the beneficent, I would circle that word, ends of its institution. Now, some of these words are obviously a little bit obscure, like what is beneficent men? Well, you, you, you obviously see the word benefit from beneficent. That is to say, who, who's going to be best served? That's always going to be the question. Notice resolved is fully capitalized by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled two-thirds of both houses concurring that the following articles be proposed to the legislatures of the several states as amendments to the Constitution of the United States. All or any of these articles when ratified by three-fourths of the said legislatures to be valid to all intents and purposes as part of the said Constitution. And then the, word, and then the letters V-I-Z, that is, namely. In other words, now we're going to list them. Notice on page 32, articles, in addition to an amendment of the Constitution of the United States proposed by Congress and ratified by the legislatures of the several states pursuant to the fifth article of the original Constitution. Okay, now here we go. we got ten of them. Let's work through them quickly. And above or beside each one of these, jot down in your own words what you think is specifically being protected here. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, of the press, or the right of the people peaceably, I would circle that word, to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Okay, well obviously you got a mouthful there. 
notices the first one. Obviously, maybe for many of uh, Americans, it's considered the most precious of them all. Freedom of religion, as well as freedom to, to prohibit, as well as freedom to enforce. Notice, we have freedom of speech. We have freedom of the press. We have the right of the people to peaceably assemble. Obviously, it's always going to be a question about peaceably. Like, what does that actually mean? And then, of course, the idea of the right of the people to peacefully assemble is going to be, um, uh, at times, a central argument in the history of American thought. Think about the American Civil War. Amendment 2. A, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, obviously, we know today this is one of the most debated of the Articles of the Bill of Rights. This idea, first of all, notice a militia and a well-regulated um, uh, militia. That is to say, we've got to defend ourselves. And then secondly, the right to keep and to bear arms shall not be infringed upon. Obviously, it's always going to be a question about what does it mean to keep and to bear arms, what arms. Obviously, it's going to be a huge part of the debate all the time. And we can't be in, this right can't be infringed upon. Interesting, right? So down what your thoughts are about this one. Obviously, at 3B, I want you to I want you to personally respond to each one of these, right? Bill uh, Amendment Three. Now, this one won't make sense to most of you because it's a historic one that has a lot to do. With, arguably, that the, all of these are to some degree historic, but for sure, this one is rooted in history. And uh, obviously, our study of the Declaration of Independence will help us with this one. No soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Dude, what's that about? Well, it's simple. The idea is, any time that there's military action, military can't show up at your house, walk into your house and say, we're taking over your house because we need to m make certain number of soldiers live in your house in, in wartime or, or, or the possibility of wartime. Now, why does that matter? Well, go back to our study of the Declaration of Independence. This is exactly what the British had done, where they forced British soldiers to live in m many of the houses of the colonialists, and obviously it's an infringement on their space right, if you want to think about it that way. Right? The Fourth Amendment. <laughs> the right of the people to be secure, I would circle that word, in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures, shall not be validated, uh, violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, I would circle that term, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Well, many of you are smiling because, of course, you know this one all too well. That is to say, people do not have the right to take your stuff, to mess with your stuff. In other words, you don't have the right to come into my room and take my stuff without my giving you a, a, a head nod that says, yeah, that's fine. Hmm. Well, it's funny, sometimes students will ask, well, why do we have to write these down? I mean, this is fairly self-evident, to use the language of Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence. Well, yes and no, because there's a, there's a long history of usurpations, abuses, usurpations, the way that Jefferson says it. This needs to be said out loud. You just can't walk into somebody's house and just take their stuff. It's against the rules. It's against the law. Amendment 5. No person, now this is an important one, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime, capital of course meaning punishable by execution, right? unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia, when in actual service in time of war or public danger, nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, this will call double jeopardy, or shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. When you hear people say, I'm going to take the fifth, that's what this is about. Nor be derived of life, liberty, or property. Now that's fascinating because that's John Locke's language as we talked about in the Declaration of Independence. It's not life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Here it's life, liberty, or property. Without due process of law, circle the phrase due process. Nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Americans from the very beginning understood that property matters. And it remains important in the thinking of American thought. Now, obviously, it's always going to be a debate. Like, who gets to decide what property belongs to the individual versus the group? Think about the park that we live close to, Yellowstone Park. Well, for a while, of course, this park has been considered the people's park, right? These national parks, as we know about the, the power of Roosevelt and others, okay? So with that in mind, this debate here is, you cannot mess around with people's property. It's such an important American concept, because what does it say? Space matters. 
my space, your space. Now we can share that space only if we agree to share that space. You can't mess with my space. Also, you can't, you can't mess me up legally, you can't take me to court or whatever, without some kind of real explanation as to what's going on. Now the Sixth Amendment has as well to do with the whole thing of prosecution. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy, that's a fun word, enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial. Speedy, of course, meaning only that it's not going to take forever for it to happen. By an impartial jury, I would circle the word impartial, of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed, I would circle the word, of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witness in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. The Sixth Amendment says, anytime you have to go in front of the court, in front of a judge, you gotta have representation available to you. You can turn it down, but you gotta have at least the opportunity. Let's say this out loud. What are we saying here? Well, from the very beginning, America is founded on law, borrowing heavily from that ancient Roman tradition that there's got to be there's got to be law, and lawyers therefore are going to be fundamental to what it means to understand American freedom, American democracy. The Seventh Amendment, uh, in suits of common law where the value in controversy shall exceed twenty dollars, this is fun. Okay, we we'll smile about this today. The right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the laws, the rules of the common law. Amendment 8, excessive bail. Notice how, how many of these amendments have to do with incarceration. Excessive bail, of course, who's going to decide excessive is always the issue, right? Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. This cruel and unusual punishments. Some of you smiling because these are this is language you've heard before. You just maybe didn't know that this is where it originated. The Ninth Amendment, the enumeration of the Constitution of certain rights, shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. In other words, these are not all of the rights. Notice the evolution of the idea of rights from life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness to now the Bill of Rights, these ten. And yet the argument is this is not an inclusive list. There are other concerns, other rights. And finally, the Tenth Amendment, the powers not, get, not delegated to the United States by the Constitution or prohibited by its states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Now, this is a huge amendment. And this is going to be standing behind the whole study that we will have later of the American Civil War, as Lincoln will refer to it. This idea, in other words, is going to be a war of succession. It's a war of the states. The Confederacy will want to argue that slaves are our property. Now, this is an abhorrent idea to us today. And yet, if we're going to understand American thought, we've got to understand the way that this document was handled during that time. If slaves are property, well, humans can't be property. Uh, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. You're absolutely right. But if slaves are our property, you cannot take our property without our saying that it's okay. And to that degree, the states have the right to decide. Well, what happens when the federal government decides that the states can't make those decisions? Well, that's when we have to go to war. That is foundational to our understanding of the American moment in uh, Abraham Lincoln. We'll, of course, get to that. Now, I want you to answer these questions on 33, but I really want you to get some consideration about what it means to write freedom. Thank you.